Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's National Geographic Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. Very excited for today's Hangout. Uh, not only is it our first, or actually it's our second Explorer Classroom of the month, but today we are joining Erica Bergman at Aquatica Submarine. And right now they're working on the maintenance and rebuilding of one of the submersibles that she pilots and getting ready for the spring. So Erica is a submersible pilot, a virtual reality engineer, and an enthusiastic ocean explorer. She founded Global Engineering and Exploration Counselors to provide a network of engineering camps and mentorship to girls around the world. So Erica, it's absolutely awesome to have you joining us today. We've got a great group of classrooms from around Canada and the United States. We're excited to learn just a little bit more about what you do. Yeah. Hey, guys. Everybody smile and wave. I can see you. <laughs> Hi. Huh. Um, raise your hand if you want to see a submarine. So all this time where I'm sitting right now, I'm actually about 10 feet up in the air sitting on the back deck of our submarine in the warehouse. So the first thing that I want to do is show you the warehouse a little bit. So that's actually a big acrylic bubble right here. And that's the whole um, front end of the submarine that we sit in. So I'm just sitting up here crouched on top of the submarine in the workshop. And I thought I would show you where we build submarines. So um, back here in the back corner, uh, we've got Crosland and Bodie. And what they're doing right now is they're uh, bending tube. So the submarine has a, an air system and we're, we're basically putting new lungs in the submarine. We're, we're putting all new tubing in. So the submarine is um, in a really cool place right now. You get to see a submarine um, like you wouldn't normally get to see it, which is all kind of uh, in pieces behind me. And the only part that's still majorly intact is the, the frame and then the big submarine bubble here. And I'll take you guys down in the bubble in a second. And then over on uh, this side of the shop, we have all of our, it's just a regular shop, just kind of like you'd have in your garage with a bunch of tools. Only we have a lot of uh, high pressure air and uh, flammable oxygen and, and really cool engineering tools to, to, to use our submarine offshore. So we are in Vancouver, British Columbia. So I'm in Canada, which I know a bunch of you are in Canada and really excited about it. Um, I just moved up here from San Francisco and I just love it. Who'd have thunk? Vancouver is beautiful. So I figured now, very awkwardly, I'm gonna take you into the submarine and uh, don't, don't judge me, this is kind of tricky. Oh, first I have to take my shoes off. We're very good about keeping dirt out of the sub. We wear steel-toed boots, just like you would at a job site. And then I crawl into this hatch right here. And, okay, everybody, hold your breath. Here we go. There we go. And now, you are inside the submarine with me. So I wanted to show you some cool stuff in here. Um, I've got a few of our, of our operational procedures to show you. Um, can, everybody, can everybody see everything cool in here? Give me a big thumbs up if you can see the submarine behind me. Yeah, cool. Um, so, so here's the tour. Uh, this is a three-person submarine. Um, I call it uh, a womaned submarine. It's called a manned submersible, but I call it a womaned submersible, you know, obvious reasons. Um, so we fit three people in here. So if you were in the submarine with me, you'd be sitting right here in this seat. Um, and then your neighbor sitting next to you would be sitting in this seat right here. And uh, the pilot, that's me, I sit right here in the middle. And the cool thing about the middle seat is access to all of the useful tools in the submarine that we need to actually pilot the vehicle. So over here, this is a cool panel. It shows our depth and it shows our oxygen levels. It shows um, all of our life support systems because once we close that hatch, there's no getting out. There's no air moving back and forth. We become a tiny little self-contained ecosystem. It's like our own little planet Earth inside here. So we close the hatch and then we have to put oxygen into the atmosphere and scrub carbon dioxide out. Is anybody, you guys familiar with your uh, metabolic processes? Human beings exhale carbon dioxide and inhale, use the oxygen. 
So we have to recreate that environment, which is pretty cool. So that's our, that's our O2 and life support system on my left side over here, or my port side in submarine world is the electrical panel. So the submarine is run entirely off of batteries. It's fully electric. It's got as much power as an electric car. It's, it's a very big battery system and we can operate anywhere between eight and 10 hours underwater um, and then still transit back and forth to the marina where we pull the submarine out of the water every night after diving. So this electrical panel, what you can see are um, our, our computer. We've got an underwater telephone to talk to the surface a whole bunch of different types of lights, a whole bunch of different types of sonars, altimeters, depth finders, all kinds of cool scientific instrumentation so that we can take data the whole time we're diving. And it also helps us pilot. It's pitch black down there, just absolutely pitch black. So we need lots of light and lots of sensors to be able to, to operate in that kind of environment. And um, if, you, if you set down too quickly on the bottom, you'll kind of blow a bunch of sediment up in the air. So sometimes we have to sit on the bottom for a while, let the sediment blow away and then turn our lights on. But what's really cool in the dark, um, sometimes we have the lights off for a while waiting for the sediment to settle and there's bioluminescence everywhere. And so when you're looking out the bubble, it's like starscape in front of you. It's like tiny little glittering blue and green lights in every direction. And you just sort of peacefully sink into this very zen place and you kind of feel like you're in outer space, but you're in inner space. So um, over here, I thought I mentioned really quickly that we have an underwater telephone. And it's not like a phone where you pick up and call your buddy on a cell phone. The way that our underwater telephone works is, okay, so, so you know how whales have a really loud song and they say that, one whale can hear another whale from sometimes up to hundreds of miles apart. That sound wave is traveling through the water as a wave and, and the whales can hear each other. So we kind of do something similar, only a human voice, the, the level that our voices wouldn't transmit very far in water. So we have a system where we speak into a microphone and then that signal is shot really long and really far through the water to be picked up by our surface support boat. So we have a ship that always goes with us and they're listening for us and they can pick up that signal and then talk back down to us. So we wear a headset here. Let me put you, let me put you up against the oxygen monitor here. <laughs> See if I can do that. Oh, if we all stay, there we go. You might be sideways. It's just my phone and a submarine. Submarines aren't perfect for selfies. They're not designed for selfies. Um, so here's the headset, just like this. And I can hear you through the these. And then there's a little button on the back, just like on an airplane. And I can talk through the microphone. So during a dive, what you typically hear is um, you say the name of the submarine and you say the name of the surface support vessel, and then you give your message. So it's a little bit crackly and it's underwater. So it would sound a little bit like this. It would sound like topside, topside, stingray. We are at depth 250 feet on bottom. And then you would hear the surface respond back. Copy that, copy that stingray. This is topside. You are at depth 250. Transit to the west to arrive at the target. And they'll guide us to, whoopsies. <laughs> they'll guide us to the dive target that we, um, that we're excited to take scientists down to or go film. So that's how the underwater telephone works. And then we also have, how do you, like, how do you drive this thing, right? How do you drive a submarine? Well, you drive it with a joystick. So this is kind of just like a video game joystick. I put it in my lap just like that. And it's got um, forward and backwards. Here, I'll get you closer, like that, left and right. And then the submarine can actually pivot. So, wait, where are you? There we are. So you can spin the controller back and forth. Then we also move up and down. So this dial here, yeah, where are you? <laughs> That's tricky, I can't do that. There's another little dial right here 
which will turn the submarine um, and move it upwards and downwards. So it's more like flying an airplane than it is like driving a car because you're going up and down, forward, backwards, left and right. You're spinning, you're, you're crab crawling, as we, t as we say. And the whole time that's happening, there are these huge ocean currents moving all around you that are trying to push you out of the way, kind of like big winds pushing your car. Um, so it's a really fun, very dynamic place to be underwater piloting a submarine. Um, and I have a little bit of footage from some of my dives. And I, uh, I thought maybe Joe might uh, queue up that video and show you guys some footage from underwater. You want to see it? <laughs> All cool. right. I see jumping. They definitely want cool. to see. Cool. Um, Erica, you can hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. So I'm going to go to the share screen now. Okay. So you're going to see it share over to my screen. And then we're going to play this little video. There we go. We're in action. My name is Erica Bergman. I'm a submarine pilot and an explorer. If I had the choice, of course I would go to space. But let me ask you this. Do you want to see aliens? Maybe? If you get a chance to be an astronaut in 20 years? Or do you want to see aliens right now? Because I can show you aliens. They're straight down. Copy that. Preparing to dive, dive, dive. If you become a deep ocean explorer, you get to name things after yourself. How cool is that? Some sort of like diatomaceous ooze can have your name on it. We call it sea snot. That could be your sea snot. That could be my sea snot. So we can have sea snot together. Our oceans kind of have this stunning thing. Every 14,000 years, the water that we call surface ocean right now becomes the deep ocean. So essentially, we are exploring the deep ocean right now. It's just the future. When you spend time on the water, what you discover is that the ocean, it isn't blue. It's green and it's orange and it's textured. It wiggles. It's got frills. It pulsates sometimes and oftentimes it has teeth. In places like these, like the elephant seal rookery that we passed on our way up from Santa Barbara, there are enormous ecosystems that grow up around these little rocky spaces. And elephant seals spend eight to 10 months a year at sea. They are absolutely sea creatures. They can dive 6,000 feet deep. It's just a live, moving, dynamic ecosystem. And we are lucky enough to get to be its explorers. All right, I hope that played okay. I'm gonna come back now. Stop the share Some screen. Ocean footage. All right, that was really cool, Erica. Cool. So that's a little taste of what's underwater. Um, so I figure we should we should open it up um, to some to some questions. So Joe, do you wanna do you wanna get the the ball rolling with um, the Q and A? Sounds good to me. Let me just plug my headset in so I can hear a little better. Yeah. All right, but, uh, switch over and we should be in business now. So like I said, we've got a great uh, group of classrooms joining us from uh, different places around North America. Um, let's meet one of them. So our first class, we are going to go to uh, there we go. Let's go to Woodbridge, Virginia. We've got grade fives joining us with Mrs. Pollock. Let me turn your microphone on. How's everybody doing in grade five today? <laughs> that was awesome. Oh. 
We have about um, about 70 kids in here. Oh my gosh, that's fantastic. I'm so excited to meet you all. Hi, welcome inside the submarine. <laughs> All right. Well, let's have it, guys. Do you have a question for Erica? All right. We have one right here. What got you really into, like, oceanography or, you know, the ocean? What got you into it? Um, that's a really good question. I think going to the beach, like, that's all there is to it is you go to the beach and you dip your toes in the water. And all of a sudden you realize that it's not a flat, hard, uniform surface. It's not a tabletop. It's a gigantic, moving, vibrant, alive thing. And you can only see it if you go underwater. It's like, um, it's like if you look at a skyscraper and you didn't know that it was an office building and you didn't know about all of the tiny little people working in there and all of the cubicles and all of the printers and the air circulation system and you didn't know about the Wi-Fi and you didn't know about the drama and the interactions between different people, you would have no idea looking at a skyscraper from the outside, how much was going on in there. I think when you go to the beach and you look at the surface of the ocean, it's like looking at a skyscraper from the outside. And then when you realize that there's a door that you can step inside and this whole world opens up around you, you, you just can't stop getting into the ocean. All right, great question and an awesome, awesome answer. I like that a lot, that skyscraper yeah. analogy. Uh, perfect. Well, thank you, Mrs. Pollock's class. We'll try to visit you again, but let's meet in other classrooms. We're going to go to Mrs. Uh, Ballard's classroom. They are joining us from Kiss Me, so I believe in Florida, and they're a grade three class. So how's everyone doing in grade three today? <laughs> All right. Do you guys have a question for Erica? Yeah. Okay. Um, how deep can the... Oh, that's a really good question. I can't believe I didn't mention that. I'm glad you asked it. Um, all the submarines that we pilot are different. This one goes 500 feet deep. So if you are on top of... A basically like a 50 story building and you look down at the ground and you see the itty bitty little cars and the itty bitty little people. That's how the submarine would look if you could see through the ocean at us sitting on the bottom. All right. Great question. Let's see. Let's go to Alistair, Ontario right now with grade fours joining I'm us. With I'm oh, still right. listening. I'm still listening. I'm just readjusting here. Okay. That's okay. Um, <laughs> So we're going to, there we go, grade four in Allison, Ontario, uh, with Mrs. McKaig. And let me turn your microphone on. We'll see if you guys can be nice and loud like the other classrooms. You're Are you doing grade four? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> see, that's the best part about doing this, is I can disrupt classroom <laughs> schools everywhere. It's so good. And then I don't get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's have your question. Um, when you go, um, what happens when you go underwater and something goes wrong? Oh, that's a really good question. Many people are afraid of, of what can happen in a submarine, especially when you're down that deep. Um, the nice thing about a submarine is that for every system, there are generally two backup systems. So even if, you're, if one backup system fails, so if, if your initial system fails, you go to the backup, the backup fails, there's a backup even to that one. There's triple redundancy, we call it, on every life support system. So it's very difficult to get in a situation which would be dangerous. That being said, we pilot the submarine very carefully so that we don't end up in these situations that are possible. I think the, the most dangerous thing for a submarine would be if we got entangled. The seafloor is completely covered in fishing nets. Huge, huge, gigantic, heavy fishing nets that have been lost off of fishing boats. They weigh thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds. And so if we accidentally got caught in one of those fishing lines, just like the sea creatures that get caught in them, um, we would be stuck for a very long time. 
Now, fortunately, we have four days of life support. So it, it, we can sit in the submarine for four days on the seafloor while somebody comes down to rescue us. So the goal is not to have that happen. And it would be very rare. Um, but we are, we are prepared for it just in case it would happen. All right. Great question. Yeah. Four days. That's... I know. That's crazy, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully you have a deck of cards or something. You can occupy yourself. Yeah. Um, hey, hey, Joe, I'm just realizing yeah. I think the video is dragging a lot of the battery out. I should run into the other, the other office. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and do sure. it fast enough that I don't cut out. But if I just cut out for like two minutes, I'll be right back. Are you guys okay with that? That's okay. okay. Why don't you make that transition and I'll introduce the next classroom and hopefully we're ready. Um, okay. Hey, Bodie, yeah. hold that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Just put me on mute while I do this. Okay, I will. All right. So boys and girls, uh, like Erica said, she's going to make a quick transition because the, the battery on her phone is being drained by the video. So while we wait uh, for the transition, you can see it's not easy climbing out of a submersible. So no, it's not at all. It's about she's to on get, her way to the next location. It's about to get really awkward. Um, let's see. So we're next we're going to move over and we're going to head to Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba in Canada. We're going to visit a grade 7 classroom, uh, Mrs. Slater's class. Thank you. And let me turn their microphone on and see how they're doing today. So Hi. Hello. Hi, grade seven. How are you? Hi. All right. Well, we're excited to be joined by your group. We were joined by, I think, your school yesterday. We hung out with some grade 10 students, so that was pretty cool. So we're excited to have the grade uh, seven joining us today. And if you watch on the camera, you can actually see Erica quickly transitioning from building to building. So we're getting a little bonus view of uh, uh, the harbor of the marina. So that's pretty cool. Um, our next Explore classroom is coming up on the 31st. And we're going to, oh, sorry. Yeah, the 31st, we're going to hang out with Ben Mirren. And Ben Mirren is a wildlife DJ. And so he goes around, he collects sounds from around the world. Uh, different habitats and such, and then he uses them to make music. So I highly suggest that you check that out. You can check it out on the National Geographic yeah, Education yeah. YouTube page, and I believe it's the 31st at 11 a.m. Eastern, so that'll be pretty cool. And then I think Erica's settled back in. Thumbs up. Do you Hi, still have me? Oh, let me unmute you. Hi. There we go. Hi. Hey. Good transition. <laughs> Did I stay in the whole time? Uh, pretty much. I think we lost your video for a moment, but then we got a sweet uh, run through the marina. So that was pretty cool. Sweet. <laughs> so All welcome right. to uh, the other half of, of submarining, which is the, uh, the office portion. So this is where we design our submarines and uh, design and, and fabricate in here. So we're just in this nice little marina. Anyway, there we go. All right. Well, okay. I am... Super excited for another question. I love these questions. Perfect. Well, in case you couldn't hear us, I was just telling them next week we're hanging out with Ben Mirren for a little wildlife DJ action. So we're excited about that. Ben is uh, so super. He is. Yeah, definitely. And then we introduced Mrs. Slater's grade sevens in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And I think they're ready with a question. Cool. Hey, go ahead. How many dives have you done? And how old were you when you did your first dive? I love that question. Um, that's fantastic. Hi, hi, Winnipeg, Manitoba. It must be cold there. <laughs> um, I did my first submarine dive when I was 21 years old. Um, and I just turned 30, just so you know. <laughs> so the, it was actually within one week of graduating from college, I was hired as a submarine pilot for a little yellow submarine called Antipodes. And since then, I've got... Um, just under 300 dives. So in the last few years, I've um, piloted six different vehicles, um, everywhere from Papua New Guinea to California to Canada, Australia, all over the world. It's been really, oh, Curacao, Roatan, it's been wonderful. Um, and accrued, yeah, about 300 submarine dives plus a bunch of scuba dives. Because if you can't submarine dive on a weekend, it's worth it to go scuba diving. And I actually keep, well, I could just show you now that I'm back in the office. I can show you, not, um, look, pneumatic drawings. <laughs> I keep a book. This is my pilot log. 
here. And in this precious book, I write down every single submarine dive that I go on and exactly what happened. And I even sometimes draw pictures. Here, I'll show you an example of a pilot log and you can see, see if I can find one with a little drawing. So this, I'll give you a second to look at it, is what my pilot logs look like after every single dive. So I write down the depth and the amount of time that we spent underwater, who was in the submarine with me, a whole description of what we saw. And then in this case, um, I drew a little diagram with the submarine in here to show where all of the different sponge targets were that we found. And it looks like I wrote, oopsies, looks like I wrote that there were um, rockfish, lingcod, shrimp, sponges, um, and a whole bunch of scuba divers. <laughs> so I have a, a, a track of, of all those um, 200 plus dives in this book here. So if you start spending time in the ocean, start logging it, because you'll save it forever. All right, awesome. And very good record keeping. And <laughs> your writing is very neat. If I had a log like that, it would be hard to read, I think. Yeah. OK, let's go to another classroom. This time we are going to go to, uh, here we go, Mrs. Padilla's class, grade four in Montclair, California. Let me turn their microphone on. And I think you guys know what to do. Hi. You guys are super. How long does it take to build a submarine? Oh, that's a really good question too. Just over a year, I'm gonna I'm gonna say. So it takes about um, 18 months from the initial moment that we decide, all right, we're gonna do it, to the time that it's out on the water in somebody's hands, looking at fish. Um, about a year and a half. Um, if you want to build your own submarine, it might take you a little bit longer at first to get the designs sort of fabricated initially. So before we even start building the submarine, we have engineers design all of the systems. So the air system, which is called the pneumatic system, um, a, a hydraulic system, which uses fluids. Then, of course, the life support, which I was telling you about oxygen, the Well, it looks like Erica just dropped out. So one of two things happen, either her signal got cut out, so hopefully she'll join us back quickly, or maybe her she didn't plug it in and maybe we lost the battery. So we'll give Erica a second to uh, come back in um, to the call. So she'll probably just have to turn her phone back on and uh, find the link to follow to bring us back in. So Mrs. Padilla's class, thank you so much for that awesome question. We've got two more classrooms to visit, and we'll do that when Erica comes back into the Hangout. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I really would like to do a little submersible diving. I've been a diver for 10 years, but um, you can only go about 100, 130 feet deep when you dive recreationally. So being able to go 500 feet deep and even deeper would be pretty darn incredible. So Erica's got a pretty amazing job. Uh, to be able to do something like that. So we'll just give her a moment to sign back in. While she's doing that, let's introduce the next classroom. Um, and then we'll get, hopefully she'll be back in. So Mrs. Kempe, if you don't mind doing me a favor, you've got to turn your mic on for me because you're just off camera. Um, can you hear There it? we go. I can hear you. So Mrs. Kempe, they're grade fives, uh, joining us from Milton, Ontario, so not too far from me. Okay. Hi, Milton, Ontario. How's your day going? Good. Good. You guys enjoying the hangout with Erica so far? Yeah. Yeah? This is While we wait. hangout, so we're, we're experimenting. This is fun. Love it. All right. Well, you're also seeing the other side of live hangouts is sometimes technology can be awesome and sometimes technology can uh, can give out on you. So, oh, here comes Erica. I had to go over back to the shop again. Did you, was it the signal or the battery? It was the signal. Now I've got battery and signal. All right, those are two very important things. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, well, sorry about that. 
No, don't worry about it at all. Uh, sorry that you have to do so much running around to pull this off. <laughs> That's okay. I'm happy to. <laughs> all right. So I was just talking with um, a grade five classroom. It's their first hangout today. So they're pretty excited. It's Mrs. Kempe's class, grade fives in Milton, Ontario. So they're about <laughs> 40 minutes from me. All right, Mrs. Kempe, go ahead. Of all of the jobs you have, what's your favorite one? Of all of the favorite of what? Of all the jobs you have, what's your favorite one? Oh, favorite jobs. Um, let's see. There you go. Get some electrical cables out of your way. Of all the jobs I have, uh, well, oh, my gosh. I mean, I just I never get tired of, I never get tired of, of teaching and telling stories. So I think... As much as I love being underwater, driving around, nose deep in a controller, staring at the bottom of the ocean, going from spot to spot, looking at the sonar, looking at the life support system and piloting the submarine, it wouldn't mean anything if I didn't get to come up to the surface and tell people about the really, really, really cool stuff down there. So I think of all my jobs, one of my favorite ones is teaching marine engineering and robotics to kids just like you so that one day you can grow up and be a submarine pilot and drive the little stingray just like this. Now you can get a view of the sub. Uh, so I think storytelling is my favorite job. But of course, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with piloting a submarine either. <laughs> All right. I'm sure that piloting fuels a lot of those stories. It does. It does. Perfect. So let's visit our final classroom. We're going back um, to Manitoba. We're with Mr. Johomirsky's class. They are grade eight students. Let me turn their mic on. How are we doing in grade eight today? Hey, grade eight. How much does it cost? Would it cost to build a submarine? Ooh, the money question. Um, a three person submersible would be different than maybe a five person or even larger. Um, but you're looking at, uh, over a million dollars for a submarine. <laughs> so when you guys get a million, when you guys get a, a million and a half, somewhere between a million and a half and $3 million, then you come see me and I'm going to make you a real special submarine. I'll make it any color you want. You can take all your friends. No problem. Just come see me. <laughs> How many of you guys want to grow up to be submarine pilots now? Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I think I see hands in all the classrooms. So. Yeah. You know, one thing that I was thinking when I was, well, I've been on my run back and forth from the office a couple of times, and it gave me some time to think about, like, what, I would, what, what advice I would give to, to all seven classrooms. And I think it's that... When, when you're sort of deciding on a career and deciding on the direction you want to go, I think that everyone should pursue exactly what they want to. And if you're really, really fascinated by medicine, then you should go medical. And if you're fascinated by engineering, you should be an engineer. But all of those fields, no matter what you choose, they can all be applied to the ocean. Um, you can be a medic on a ship. You can be an engineer on a ship. You can be a scientist. You can be an oceanographer. You could be a submarine pilot. Any job you can think of. Um, even law, you can do You can do marine law, you can do uh, litigation, you can do political science, all for the ocean. And I just want everybody to realize how broad ocean careers are. And so whatever it is that you dream of that you want to do, you can do it. And you can do it with us on the water. That's pretty cool. All right. That's an excellent, excellent point. Um, so... We do have some classrooms who are watching live, so if you guys do want to put a question in on the YouTube live chat, feel free to do that. Let us know who you are and where you're watching from. But for now, because we do have a few more minutes, why don't we open things up to the classrooms live on camera. If you guys give me a wave, I'll know to come back to your classroom uh, if you have another question. So let's see. There we go. Let's go to Mrs. Kempe's class. I can reach your mic now. You're on grade fives. Bye. Oh, sorry, I'm Brad. Go ahead. Nice and loud. Oh, my goodness. Guys, <laughs> are you okay? You what? got it, man. Favorite color. <laughs> Did you hear sorry. that? No, I didn't, I didn't catch it. What was it? Your favorite color. Your favorite color. <laughs> What's my favorite color? Yeah. Oh, that's easy. It's red. 
Um, <laughs> and I know that doesn't seem like an obvious ocean color, but it is. There are so many really cool red sea creatures. Did you know that lobsters are basically immortal? They, they, their cells regenerate every seven years or so. And unless they get caught and eaten or sick and die, they don't die of old age. They just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I think that's so cool. Um, and the other, well, so lobsters are kind of red. But the other reason I love red, especially being an oceanographer, was the first time I picked out a pair of what we call foul weather gear, like your raincoat and your rain pants for the ocean. Um, I was with my dad. And I was so excited. I was probably eight or nine years old, and I picked out this great rubber suit. And it was my favorite shade of green. And I walked out, and I was so proud. And I was like, look, Dad, I got my first pair of Fowleys. And he looked at me, and he said, sweetheart, that's the perfect shade of lost at sea green. And I thought about it, and I was like, you know what? If I fall in the water, I'm going to disappear in the sea of green. And after that, red became my favorite color. Because if you're working on the ocean, you want to be as bright and visible as possible. So red all right that's a great point and bringing up red um i don't think you've talked about this yet but is there like a nice big set of lights on the submersible so you can bring back oh, some of yeah. the colors you lose yeah yeah that's another reason to love red oh well I, I can't walk you over there well maybe i can maybe it's not battery now um so i'll actually show you where do, 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 where we put the lights um, so on the front of the submarine here, this is the, this is like the front bubble and it's, there's a lot of weird reflections cause we've got a lot of lights on it right now, but on the front of the submarine, these big black pods right here that I'm, that I'm tapping, those are the battery pods and we mount lights right to this battery pod and they face forward. So right now this is just the shop floor, but in general that would be the sea floor. And so the lights face forward and down right towards the sea floor. So you can see exactly what's in front of you. But a lot of the time, especially around shipwrecks, um, which are really, really, really big, we have to have lights that face upwards too. Because again, like, like a car driving onto a ferry, we're about the same size as a car and the ferry boat is really, really big. So when the submarine drives up to a shipwreck on the seafloor, it's huge and tall above us. We also have to have lights that face upward and shine so that we can see the, the top of the boat above us. But um, uh, one of the reasons that we need lights like that, such big lights, is because red is a, a, a wavelength that's absorbed in water really, really quickly. So once you're, once you're below sunlight, there's no natural red light left. And what we have to do is, is, is light something up to get the reds back. And then you get to see all of the amazing red sea creatures. Um, and the, they kind of use red as camouflage. So if you're a deep ocean creature, and your skin is red, you'll actually kind of go invisible to all of the predators. And it's not until we light them up with submarine lights that you can actually see that they're red. I know it's kind of confusing, but it's really cool. All right, so we're gonna jump back to Manitoba with our grade eights, Mr. Drohomirsky's class, because I saw them waving for a question. <laughs> How do you get the bend? Oh, the bends? Yeah, yeah, this is, so you're probably familiar with scuba diving. So yeah. the, just as a little background, the bends um, is, is basically an, an illness that you get from, uh, scuba divers can get it and tech divers can get it if they come up to the surface from, from the deep ocean too quickly. And um, when we're, so our, our atmosphere, this air in front of us, right? It's not invisible. There's actually particles in the air in front of it. 70% of the air is nitrogen. And what happens when you're breathing air is you, you mostly breathe in the nitrogen, you exhale it. It doesn't really go anywhere at surface. But when you're underwater and your whole body is under pressure, as a scuba diver, not in a submarine, um, your whole body is under pressure, that nitrogen gets concentrated in your, in your, in your, your, your veins, in your blood. And if you surface too quickly, it starts to bubble out. And you can imagine like blowing bubbles in your milk. If those bubbles could like escape through the straws, if the straws were your veins, that's kind of what's happening. The nitrogen is, is bubbling out of your, your veins too quickly. And it's really, really dangerous. Um, that can happen if, you're, if your body itself is exposed to pressure. Now, inside a submarine, once we close that hatch on top of us, the atmosphere 
stays completely uh, one atmosphere, it's called. It stays the surface pressure and doesn't change. So we can't get bent in a submarine because we're not under pressure. Only the bubble outside of us is under pressure. We're protected inside this little underwater housing. Does that answer the question? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. Well, we have about four more minutes. So let's see. Wave at the camera if we have some more questions. And the next, the next group, I want you to tell me your favorite sea creature. Whoever asked the question, tell me your favorite sea creature. All right. Well, there's lots of waving, but let's go to Mrs. Padilla's classroom. And yeah. Natalia. Okay. <laughs> that was great. Hi, Ms. Padilla's classroom. <laughs> Hello. Okay, what's your first what's your favorite sea creature? My favorite sea creature is a octopus. An octopus. That's a good one. My question is where do you plan to dive next and where's your favorite place to dive? Oh, those are really good questions. Um fortunately, lucky for me, they're both the same. So I, I'm in this new place. I've been here um, in Vancouver, British Columbia for a little while diving the submarine. And there's this creature, this organism, this animal called a sponge. And you kind of think of your house sponge or the sponge that you do your dishes with. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a dish sponge, <laughs> but it is what sponges are named after. It's this porous sea creature. And the ones out here are made out of glass. So they're, they're animals, but instead of being made out of carbon, and like we are, our muscle and bone, we're mostly made out of carbon, they're made out of glass. And so it's, it's a sponge, but it's kind of see-through and porous and yellow, and it, it's, they're just absolutely beautiful and bizarre. And they were only recently discovered. We had no idea that they even existed, and it turns out they're the oldest animal on planet Earth what? And we didn't even know they existed. So, so out here in British Columbia, we have a dive site really, really close to where we are right now. And it's sponges. And they're so magical. I could spend all day. I do spend all day on them. And, and they're not only my favorite dive site right now, they're the dive site that I get to go to next time we put the submarine in the water. That's, I mean, it's, it's just absolutely magic out here. And the water is green, which is very unusual and beautiful. Instead of like blue and crystalline, it's, it's green. And so it's just, it's magic. It's like going to an aquarium and seeing something that you've never seen before. And instead of you going up to the tank and putting your hands on the glass and looking at the fishes, it's the fishes coming up to the glass and putting their fins on the tank and looking at you. And that's cool. Awesome. All right. Maybe we can squeak one more in. Yeah, let's, let's do it. See. I'm sorry, I know I can't pick every class. Everyone's waving. Uh, let's go to Mrs. Ballard's class this time. Microphone's on. In Kissimmee, Florida. Can you guys hear us? All Hi. Right. Hello. Have animals hit your submarines? <laughs> um, yes, they have. We're very safe behind our, behind our bubble, but um, <laughs> everybody wants to know if, like, I shark could bite it and we would be in danger. We wouldn't be in danger. Um, but out here in, in House Sound in Vancouver where we dive, we also have these, these sharks called six gill sharks. And your typical shark has five gills, the little holes in the side of their neck. These ones are ancient and old and unchanged for thousands of years. And they have six gills on each side, really ancient species. And they're really, really big. So what we do is we get a few hundred pounds of chum, which this is really gross, but it's basically just mushed up dead fish guts. And we freeze them and we stick them in a bucket and we, and we drop them down to the bottom and let them sit there for like three or four days. They just kind of soak out and the sharks smell it and they come in. And then on the fourth day, we go down in the submarine and we sit on the bottom and they're very shy. So we have to wait for hours and hours and hours. But eventually the sharks come in towards us. And um, the way that, that sharks sense things in the water is in their nose, they have these electroreceptors. And so they can sense a battery-powered electric vehicle. 
and they find us fascinating because they can't tell, is it food? Is it not food? I got to figure out what it is. They can't see very well. It's really dark. They can smell fish guts. So they think there's food around and then they get this electrical signal. So they'll come up and, and then they'll, they'll bump the dome and swim away and bump the dome and swim away and bump the dome and swim away. And, and over, over the course of a few hours, we'll have a lot of these sharks come in and check us out and then realize it's not food and check us out and realize it's not food. It's, it's pretty cool. Oh, that does sound awesome. I'm jealous. I... There's, some, there's some video of it, actually. I didn't show it on this one, but if you, there's a, a YouTube channel. Maybe your teachers can, can find this um, for you guys to see one day. Uh, our, our YouTube channel, Aquatica Submarines, we have a, a video about six-scale sharks in the submarine, and you can see the sharks bumping into the submarine window. Perfect. I'll try to remember to send a link to uh, – it's on the YouTube for Aquatica? Yeah. Aquatica okay. Submarines YouTube. Perfect. All right. Well, Erica, before we, we sign off for today, maybe uh, if you just spend maybe just a minute and um, tell us a little bit about the camps you run, because those are pretty cool. Oh, yeah, I would love to. Um, my biggest one ever is happening in February next in a couple of weeks. So I know that the boys want to participate, too. But um, this is a, a program that I run for girls, um, generally ages 12 to 16. And I teach them how to build underwater robots. I teach them how to build, they're called remotely operated vehicles, ROVs. They're like, like mini, not that small. <laughs> they're miniature submarines. They're um, a little bit bigger than a shoebox, and they go down 100 meters, which is crazy deep. Um, that's 300 feet, which is cool. And they spend three days with me, and we build remotely operated vehicles, these little kits. Um, and you can find the kits for yourself. Um, Either you can, you can find us through Geeks, which is Global Engineering and Exploration Council, Counselors, which is the, the girls' program, Girls Underwater Robot Camp. Um, but the kits we use are from OpenROV, and you can even find those yourself um, at openrov.com. And they're, they're educational, but they're also really, really, really high-level, valuable scientific instruments. So it's kind of like the best of both worlds. It's... Um, either you build it yourself and take it out and, and explore or you join us at girls underwater robot camp and have whole three day filled adventure of robot building. And um, we go out on a ship and we deploy our ROVs um, wherever we happen to be. So if any of you are now around Tampa in two weeks, I'm running a big program for 40 kids in Tampa, Florida. So check it out. Girls underwater robot camp. All right. Invite awesome. your friends. Yeah. We've, we've been able to host you from the camp before, so yeah, we'll try again. Pretty cool. All right. Well, Erica, once again, thank you so much for uh, a great hangout, for showing us the sub, yeah. and for working hard. I know you didn't know you'd be running back and forth between the buildings, but it worked <laughs> out. And Thanks for being with me. Ah, no worries. Well, it was great. I know the classrooms had a great time, uh, and I look forward to our next hangout together. Same. Well, it was nice to meet you all. Have fun today. And dream up your future lives working on the ocean. And you might get to use one of these. All right. Well, let me turn the mics on because we'll let them be loud one more time to say goodbye and thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a great night. And we're signing off for today. Thanks, Erica. Okay. Bye, Joe. Ciao.